Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship. We are so glad that you're here. It's been a full morning around Elfenwild Church. For those who are online, welcome. For uh, Glad you're joining us through the live stream. Uh, if you're online, would you mind signing the virtual friendship pad? And if you're here, would you mind finding the blue friendship pad and sign that so we would know you were here this morning? If you uh, smell uh, good food, that's because there's a pancake breakfast going on downstairs, and it has been really a wonderful morning. Uh, I just need to, I need to point out, first of all, our scurrying around up here is because the electric went out for some reason, uh, which would like uh, affect a little bit. So Ron is not only the master electrician, he directs handbells and the choir, plays the organ and the keyboard. And did you notice as he was directing, he played five different bells? <laughs> Unbelievable. Just amazing. Beloved, um, we started the inquirers class this morning for those who might be interested in membership or have questions of faith. If you missed this morning but you're still interested in coming, please come next Sunday, 9.45, during the Sunday school hour, downstairs in the Peach Room. And we would love to have you. Even if you uh, missed it today, that would be fine. No problem. Next Sunday... We will have a special speaker, and it is uh, in your announcements and in the information in the bulletin. Uh, but Elizabeth will be here. She is the national spokesperson for Operation Christmas Child this year. She was an orphan in Ukraine when she was a child, re received a shoebox from Operation Christmas Child, and through that process uh, became a Christian. And she then has gone over to Ukraine now as a young adult and handed out shoeboxes to other orphans that are in Ukraine. So she'll be here uh, to tell uh, her part of God's story next Sunday. I invite you to come and be a part of that. The following uh, Sunday, April 30th, we have a seasoned saints lunch. Um, I think the registration deadline is past due. But I suspect if you would get your word in quickly, they will accept it. So, seasoned saints, please get your registration in for that. Also, in your bulletin, there is this colored insert. If you could take that out um, so I can explain a few things to you. It is regarding the church has left the building, which is happening on a Saturday near the end of May. And um, there are two things on that uh, insert. The first one is in a box up there, and it talks about uh, collecting items for homeless men and women, and that there will be boxes here at the church for you to bring those supplies for the homeless through May 14th. The rest of that list is not for the homeless, but for the blessing board. The Blessing Board is a mission uh, locally that distributes furniture and things like that. They will have a truck, or trucks plural, here on that Saturday if the church has left the building. And this is what they will take. Okay, This is what they will accept. And they give that furniture away. They don't sell it. It is a ministry and a mission. In your announcements, there's more information about the church has left the building and some contact information for Becky Winnick if you have any questions. So please um, take note of that. On the top of that announcement sheet, there is also a headline about scouting for food. Next Sunday is Scout Sunday, so they will be here. And this morning they've been at the doors passing out flyers for the Scouting for Food Drive. So please uh, pay attention to that as well. There are many, many things in your bulletin for you to read and opportunities for you to participate in ministry and mission. So let me encourage you to look through those. There is also a prayer list in your bulletin. So please take note of that. And let me share with you two additions 
uh, to that prayer list. The first one is laying down here with her new cast on, and that is Caitlin Powell, who had surgery this past week on her broken elbow. So uh, please pray for Caitlin and her recovery, but pray for the two whose heads you can see, uh, because it has been a long weekend for them for sure. The second person is Skip Young. Uh, Skip is in AHN Wexford and is awaiting uh, for a room and a rehab, but he has been having some seizures lately. So if you could pray for Skip and his wife, Penny, as they navigate this new chapter uh, in their life together. Nicole is going to come forward and share about Bible school. Hello. It seems um, so soon to be talking about Bible school, but it is coming. It is right around the corner, and we have already um, opened our registration. It uh, was available to sign up on Monday, and we already have over 50 students signed up, which is really uh, wonderful and amazing. Uh, but we do have a cap, a limit to how many our church can uh, hold. So if you have not registered your child for VBS yet, uh, they, they are um, ages 4 through 5th grade are allowed to attend, and it is from June 19th through the 23rd. So if you have not signed up your camper, please do that. In your pews, you have a little sheet here that has the QR code. You can just take a picture, um, and that will take you right to the website or on the back. You can just see our website link there to sign. Uh, your camper's up for VBS. Um, also, on the back, you will see that we need volunteers um, for all five stations that uh, the children will rotate through each day. And um, so volunteers can be sixth grade uh, through adults. And uh, there is a code there to scan if you want to sign up to volunteer. Also, you can find that information on the website. But I want to encourage you to take this home and fill it out today. Thank you. Special welcome to the families who are here for baptism and also to let everybody know following the baptism as we sing the hymn, you can meet Mrs. Jans and others over here, the children can, I'm sorry, to go to Young Child in Worship and we'd be grateful for that. The week after Easter in the church sometimes has been called Cannonball Sunday. Have you ever heard that term? And that came about, and it was that the Sunday after Easter, you could shoot a cannonball down the middle aisle and hit nobody. <laughs> well, we're not quite nobody, but we're certainly a lot less than we were last Sunday. But let's take a moment to stand and greet those around you, share the peace of Christ together.
Friends, the call to worship is a response of reading. It's in your bulletin. Uh, let's use this word of God to offer our praise uh, and our thanksgiving. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Let's stand together. Let's pray together, friends. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your truth and love that we know in Jesus Christ, who is the risen Lord. On this Sunday after Easter, we live in the afterglow of life that has triumphed over death, of love that has conquered sin. Thank you for the gift of salvation that we know in your Son, our Savior. God, you are faithful every day. Your mercies are new every morning. Your grace is sufficient for our every need. There is nothing to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. You are worthy of our praise and thanksgiving. So we bring to you our hymns, we offer our prayers. We lay our lives before you 
as a holy sacrifice, hoping that you will be pleased and honored with our offerings. And God, as we gather to worship, we also ask that you would come and be near to us, each of us, on the journey. Remind us of your truth and grace that we know in Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. You may be seated. So it is our privilege to celebrate the sacrament of baptism this morning. And I couldn't help Drew and Ashley, but think not only of your families that are here, but um, your family that isn't here. And uh, particularly your grandmother, uh, Drew Dot. And uh, it just is a precious moment to know that you're bringing uh, Ralph to be baptized into the covenant family of Christ, uh, into the church. And uh, we're so grateful for that. Just a reminder for all of us, baptism is one of the two sacraments, right? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And both of them point to the same truth, that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord. And they remind us of his death on the cross and his resurrection from the tomb. That's what baptism reminds us of. Christ's righteousness, his sacrifice on our behalf, and that he is our hope for salvation. And baptism calls us to faith. And while baptism doesn't save us, it is our faith in Christ and our union with Jesus that gives us hope for salvation. And so we baptize Ralph this morning, uh, remembering that and owning up to God's promises and gifts. Let me invite you guys to come on forward. Bob and Nicole, come on up, or whomever is doing that. So Drew and Ashley, you're representing Ralph this morning. And so we have questions for you because he isn't able to respond, especially right now, able to respond on his own. Let me ask you these questions and then um, your dad, his grandfather, will ask the congregation the questions. Do you reaffirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, do you? Do you claim God's covenant promises on your child's behalf? Do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation as you do for your own, do you? Do you now unreservedly promise in humble reliance upon God's grace to set before Ralph an example of the new life in Christ, do you? And do you promise to pray with and for him and to bring him up in the knowledge and the love of God, do you? you do. To the congregation, do you, the members of this congregation, in the name of the whole Church of Christ, undertake with these parents the Christian nurture of this child, so that in due time he may confess Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior? We do. Will you endeavor by your example and fellowship to strengthen his family ties with the household of God? We will. On behalf of the congregation, we have a little gift for you. Uh, there's a book about God and a handmade cross uh, that was made by one of our uh, members of the church. Um, we take our promises very seriously here, um, and we have a baptism ministry partnership. And we have um, Bethany and Joe Demore as the sponsors for, for your family. And they will continue to uh, care, nurture, and pray for your family um, over the next several years. And we also have this beautiful banner that was handmade by one of our congregants. And each lamb represents a child that has been baptized here in the past few years. So Ralph has his own little lamb, and I am going to uh, place that on the banner as well. So welcome. Let's pray together, friends. 
Holy Spirit, may the water of baptism today be set apart for your holy purpose to claim Ralph into the covenant family of God. Thank you for Drew and Ashley and their desire to raise their son in the faith, to teach him that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And thank you for the heritage of their families where faith has been passed on from generation to generation. We pray this morning that your grace would be at work in Ralph's life, calling him to make profession of faith and own the baptism that we celebrate today. We look forward to that day when he can claim Christ as Savior and Lord. Until then, be with Drew and Ashley as they teach him. Help them to be regular worshipers and learners, disciples, and be with us as a church, a family, the body of Christ, as we partner with them in teaching Ralph the faith. May we all be an example of Jesus to the world, but especially to this young one today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Christian name of your child? Ralph Robert Weinheimer. Ralph Robert Weinheimer, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You guys got it easy. See what love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. That's like angelic. I'm going to walk Ralph around as you sing the hymn, as the children meet with Mrs. Jans and those going to young child and worship up at this door. You can remain seated.
How beautiful. Friends, our call to confession is from 1 John. Hear this word. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. As practically perfect as Ralph is, He's still a sinner in need of God's grace. As wonderful as we might feel we are living in comparison to the world, we likewise are sinners in need of God's grace. Let's join together in the unison prayer of confession. Eternal God, the glory of Resurrection Day seemed to fade fast this week. Our hope was high as we remembered that Jesus overcame death and sin. We were enthused by the emotional energy of last Sunday's celebration, but it didn't take very long for the light of Christ to diminish and the darkness to creep back into life. Our attitudes seemed to change, at least for a short while. We really were more joyful last week. However, the victory of Jesus is not always easy to apply to our every day. We have been impatient with one another, and therefore with you. We have insisted on our own ways this week, and not submitted to your way. Our good intentions of being transformed by the truth of resurrection was dashed quickly when we relied on our own courage and knowledge and not on your strength and wisdom. Forgive us for our sin, for not continuing in the light of Christ. Give us new life and hope that we might be sustained for all that is ahead. Help us to persevere. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Again from 1 John, these words of assurance. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. be seated. As we prepare to give our tithes and offerings, let me pray for us. Oh God, our blessings are many. You have abundantly provided for our every need. Help us to be good stewards as we share with others who have needs. May our tithes and offerings this morning represent our desire for the good news of Christ to be spread throughout the world in word and deed. Guide and bless these gifts to be used for your holy and eternal purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.
may be seated. Let's bring our thanksgiving and our cares and concerns to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? Thank you, God, for the many gifts that we have known in your generosity. Thank you for the gift of the church, the body of Christ on earth in the world today, for baptism that reminds us of the hope we have for our children in Jesus Christ. Thank you for songs that proclaim the resurrection and the promise of life everlasting, life overcoming death in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity to turn to you in prayer at any time and anywhere we are. Thank you for being a father who is always ready to listen when his children cry out. This morning, we thank you for the gift of family, those who surround us with love and encouragement and support. Thank you for the gift of friends who share our journey with us, sometimes for a season, other times throughout all of life. Thank you, God, for the heritage and the legacy that we have been given through our family and through the life of the church. Help us to be good stewards of that heritage and history. Thank you for your mercy that is new every morning. For when we fall short, that we don't get what we deserve but by your grace, you love us. We are grateful for the gospel message and for its daily application. We take time now, Lord, to pray for our world, our communities, our family life, and our own lives that are often needy. We are broken. Life can be very messy. So we pray for strained relationships, whether it be in marriages or between parents and children or friends or neighbors. We pray for reconciliation and peace. We pray, O oh God, for our social order, for our culture that is so divided and against one another. Help us to go farther than tolerance and as Christians to live in love. Love that is unconditional, love that overcomes all things, love that has its source in your truth and grace. We pray for our own personal lives, for disciplines that are lacking, uh, for lives that seem to have no purpose or aim, for wasted hours or days, for struggles in our minds or our hearts, for physical infirmities and challenges of dis-ease. Oh God, hear our prayers. And now in this silent moment, God, we come to you with our individual concerns and are grateful that you are ready to hear us. There are times in our lives when we don't know how to pray or what to pray for. And when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, he gave them these words that bind us together with the church throughout the ages and around the world 
and even here in this place, bind us as one. Hear us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, our scripture this morning is Acts chapter 9, uh, the first 19 verses. For those who haven't been here uh, for a while, we began working our way through the book of Acts quite a long time ago. We took a brief uh, little break over Holy Week from Palm Sunday through Easter, but we're back now into the book of Acts going uh, passage by passage. In fact, uh, the week before Palm Sunday, we were already on Acts chapter 9, so we won't repeat what we said. I'll remind us of a few important points, but Acts chapter 9 is the conversion of Saul on the Damascus road. And before we read the word of God, let me pray. God, you have not left us to our own imagination to know what is true and right and good. But you are a God of revelation. You have revealed yourself to us, ultimately in your son Jesus, the living word, but also through your written word that we call scripture. You have breathed out this word for our benefit, that we might know life, that we might pursue what is right, good, and true. So open our minds and our hearts that we would receive your word today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 1, hear the word of God. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priests and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground... He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here... He has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So, Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me 
so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, In a general overview, let's be reminded that Saul was a Pharisee who was present at the stoning of Stephen and okayed it and approved it and now has been persecuting Christians in Jerusalem, wanting to push down the message of Jesus. And now he has permission to go to Damascus and to bind the believers there and bring them back men and women, who were following Christ. And on the road to Damascus, Jesus, the risen Christ, the resurrected Lord, stops him in his tracks and speaks to him. And he begins to be on the journey of believing. So my first reminder for us from last week is that Jesus is the one and the only one who brings transformation or conversion to our life. Jesus is the one who does that. Saul loses his sight. His companions lead him into the city of Damascus. He remains there. He doesn't eat or drink, and he can't see. And then the same risen Lord that stood in front of Saul visits Ananias. And the text says that there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, a follower of Jesus, a Christian, Ananias. And the Lord says to Ananias, He calls his name Ananias. And Ananias replies, here I am. Let's pause for a moment, friends. First of all, if you had a vision or if some voice spoke to you and called you by name, what would your reaction be? Who, me? But Ananias says, here I am. Now, I'm not sure what your thoughts are, but there was a season in the life of the church when we really overdid that hymn. We sang it all the time. But let's not take away from the power of that hymn because this reply of Ananias is a response that all disciples should be in the posture of giving when called on by the Lord. Ananias is not the only one to say, here I am. Isaiah said, here I am. And others throughout Scripture had that position or posture of availability. So the first thing, even before we get to that, is Ananias had ears to hear the Lord. I think for us sometimes, brothers and sisters, that we're not even in that disciplined place where we can hear from God. We're not looking for or desiring or ready for God to speak into our lives. So that's the first challenge for us from this text is that Ananias was aware of God's voice. And then the second is, he was available. Here I am, Lord. And so God says to him, rise and go. In fact, he says to go twice, which also reminds us that usually if God's calling... If God has a word for us and there's a call in our life that we have to get up 
And I think that's part of our problem. We really don't want to do that. We would rather just stay where we are, not get up and go. But the Lord calls Ananias and he says, Rise and go to the street called Straight, the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. Behold, he's praying and has seen in a vision that a man will come, lay hands on him, and that he might regain his sight. Take note of that, might regain his sight. That's what Saul was expecting, just to be healed of his physical blindness. That's what he was hoping for. That's what he was expecting. But Ananias, after he was aware and available, then says, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. He has a reputation. He's done a lot of evil things to your saints in Jerusalem, and now he's come here to Damascus to do the same. But the Lord says, go a second time, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. No matter how much evil he has committed, no matter what you might think of him or what his reputation is that goes before him, I have chosen him to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and all the children of Israel. So Ananias left the house and he goes and he finds Saul and this is his address. He says, Brother Saul, this man that he just referred to as an enemy since he was told by the Lord to go and that Saul was a chosen instrument, Ananias now refers to him with that endearing title of Brother Saul. Now there are times when we here at the church can get carried away with that as well, brother and sister, and not appreciate the depth of meaning that holds, that we are of the same family of Christ, that we are blood relatives, not the same mother or father, but the same Lord who shed his blood. And so we are brothers and sisters members of the same family of Christ. Let me just say briefly that in Scripture, the word brother and sister, those words, are used for the Christian community, not the human community. Specifically, those who are in Christ are our brothers and sisters. Certainly, there is a common humanity among us all, whether we're in Christ or not. But in Scripture, throughout the New Testament, the reference of brother means that we're one in Christ together. Brother Saul, the same Lord who appeared to you on the road came and has sent me to you that you may regain your sight and, and, Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what Saul was not expecting. That's the extra bonus and blessing that God has provided. Saul was going to know the experience and be filled with God. With the Holy Spirit. Three days before that, he was on the road to persecute those who were filled with the Holy Spirit. And now he becomes one of us. Filled with God. Overflowing with the understanding. Brother Saul, filled with the Holy Spirit. So a few reflections that I'd like to share with you about this that really matters to me. And that is Ananias is one of those disciples that we don't know much about. We only read about him right here. 
William Barclay says he's one of the forgotten heroes of the Christian church. Because if Ananias was not aware and available and obedient to God, then this same process would not have happened for Saul, who we now know as the Apostle Paul, taking the gospel to the Gentiles. That's us, friends, the non-Jews. Because the gospel is inclusive, it's not confined by race or ethnicity. It overcomes all of those human that have been raised and put up. And Saul was one who began that process of including Gentiles in the church. Secondarily, like Ananias, sometimes I wonder what God is doing and don't always see uh, his way as clearly as I should. When I was in high school, um, I grew up in the church. I was baptized in a Presbyterian church. Went to Sunday school, did youth group, went on mission trips. My dad was a police officer. I was a good kid. I behaved. I really was. And so as I was growing up as a teenager, I sort of stayed away from those troubled spots and those troublemakers. And I was stayed in the church and my friends and acquaintances and classmates knew I was a Christian. They were not, even if they went to church, or at least not in their social lives. And then I remember coming back from college and hearing that so-and-so is now a Christian. And I went, what? Him? Really? You're kidding me. Almost had a hard time believing or accepting it. So I get Ananias' hesitation. But the word of God is pretty explicit and clear that God is the one who chooses whom he uses and calls. He doesn't consult me or you. And sometimes in our Reformed theology, when we talk about being one of the chosen, and, and that's really important, and I think it's really uh, necessary for us to say, understand the sovereignty of God in our call to faith, that it really was the grace of God that irresistibly called us to Jesus. But sometimes when we start talking about the chosen, we think we knew who they are and who they aren't. And let me just warn us that God, again, doesn't work with our understanding on that. And God chooses whom he wills, not who we want to be part of our family. And so it's really important for us not to imagine for a minute that we know who's chosen and who's not. Saul would have been a candidate for those not chosen. And God says, he is. Finally, sort of coming back for full circle here. It is Jesus and Jesus alone who brings transformation and conversion. And Jesus and Jesus alone who calls people to faith and to live out their faith. And I say that because we need to be careful that we don't think we can convert anybody or transform them. And that we're the voice of God. We're an instrument of God, but not the voice of God. So we're not to do the converting, the transforming. We're simply to be faithful and to point to the one who is Jesus that changes hearts and minds. And perhaps you might be one of those that are still on the road to Damascus, right? And let me say to you, if you haven't come to that point yet, 
to not look to Christians or the church or the institution or a moral ethic of any kind for salvation or transformation, but to look for this resurrected Christ that we talk about after Easter and to look for the risen Lord and to encounter him and experience him. That's what changes your life. That's what gives you new life. That's when you die to yourself and are born again in the spirit. When you have that encounter with Jesus. Looking anywhere else or to anyone else won't do the trick. So ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. Lord Jesus, come to me. Come to me that I might know the power of transformation. That my life would be born again. That's the promise of the resurrected Christ. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your chosen instruments, people whom you have used in our lives to bring us to Christ. They have been so important, but they are not the change makers. Jesus is. Help us if we are on, still on the road to desire that encounter, that experience, that promise of new and abundant and everlasting life in him. Thank you that we can live in the light of resurrection and with the hope of life that overcomes death through Christ. Pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand, friends. Let's sing our final hymn together.
Beloved, you might not think you're an Ananias or that God is going to use you, but I ask you to be aware of God moving in your life this week. And more than that, to be available to be used by God in someone else's life as Ananias was used in the life of Saul. Because wherever you're going this week, remember it's not by accident. But God's sending you there. He has a purpose for you in that place. He wants to do something in you and through you. Remember, nothing separates us from the love of God that we know in Christ Jesus. Absolutely nothing. And the grace of God that we know in Jesus, his Son, our Savior... He is our hope. He is our salvation. May the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that filled Saul, so fill you this week that you might know God's peace and live in the light of Christ even though there is great darkness in the world. Beloved, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Amen. Mm-hmm.